Hi, Professor Zema Adomwe Pete. Welcome, my viewers and students, to this topic on units of measurement and sampling. I want to say a very big thank you to those that have subscribed to my video. I'm really impressed that up to 90 persons have subscribed to my videos. Please, if you have not subscribed, subscribe, like, comment, and share. In our previous lesson, we learned on absolute error and relative error. And an assignment was given in that lesson. And I want to say that the absolute error for that assignment was 5.25 gram, and the percentage relative error was 16%, while the relative error in pass per thousand was 460 pass per thousand. If you didn't watch the last video, do well to go and watch the last video where we talked about absolute error and relative error. In today's lesson, I expect that the student should be able to contrast the difference between the different types of measurement at the end of this lesson, state the steps involved in sampling, and describe the methods of sampling of different materials. We are looking at the types of measurement, constituent types, units of measurement, and units of expression. There are different types of measurement. We have the macro measurement where we measure materials greater than 0.1 gram the semi-micro 0.1 to 0.1 gram, the micro 0.001 to 0.01 gram, and the ultra-micro, where we measure materials less than 10 to minus 4 gram. We we'll have the constituent types. Constituent types can be represented in percentage. The major constituents, where we are at, looking for 1% to 100% is classified as a major constituent. The minor constituent, when we, when we are looking for materials of 0.01% to 1%, the trace constituent less than 0.01% trace in 1.1 1 .1 parts per billion to 1 parts per million. And then the ultra trace, where it is less than 1 parts per billion. What are the units of measurement? These different measurements are represented in different units, like in grams, in percentage of parts per hundred, where we measure macro, parts per thousand or milligram, where we measure semi-micro, parts per million and parts per billion, when we are measuring micrograms. These are the units of measurement. And we have the units of expression. Parts per thousand is one gram in 10 raised to power three grams and we can be it can be represented a gram per kilogram milligram per gram gram per liter or milligram per meal pass per million where we are looking for micro substances is one gram in 10 raised to power six gram which is actually one milligram per kilogram or one microgram per gram or one milligram per liter or one microgram per meal so we are saying here that it is equivalent, one ppm is equivalent to one milligram per liter or one milligram, one microgram per meal. One pass per billion is one gram in 10 raised to power nine gram. We translate into one microgram per kilogram or one nanogram per gram or one microgram per liter or one nanogram per meal. I have an example to present to us in the next slide. For example, one, we say express the concentration in parts per million and parts per billion. If a 2.0 gram plant tissue was analyzed and found to contain 2.5 microgram zinc. In this question, we are told that the plant tissue contains 2.0 gram and that the concentration of zinc was 2.5 microgram per zinc. So you represent your PPM as weight per weight in that measurement, microgram per gram, which also represents parts per million. The 2.5 microgram per zinc, we place it up, divide by the 2.0 gram, and you will get 1.25 gram microgram per gram. This unit is equivalent to 1.25 parts per million. And we are told to represent this in parts per billion. In parts per billion, it is represented weight per weight, nanogram per gram. And because microgram will convert that microgram to nanogram, 
and therefore we will multiply it by 10 raised to power 3 and that is why we have the 10 raised to power 3 there 2.5 times 10 raised to power 3 nanogram over 2.0 gram when you divide you will get 1.25 times 10 raised to power 3 nanogram per gram which is equivalent to 1250 parts per billion that's a way to express your concentration in ppm and ppb i've given you assignment two a 4.5 grain animal tissue was analyzed and found to contain 5.5 microgram chromium what is the concentration of chromium in parts per million and parts per billion attempt this assignment and put it on the comment section theories of laws of sampling there are laws of sampling that we must know the first law is the laws of statistical regulating which states that according to this law a moderately large number of samples chosen at random from the universe and missed uniformly to give an average sample can be termed a representative sample and is expected to represent the composition of the universe with a high probability another theory is the laws of initial of large numbers it states to us that random sampling from the universe does not mean the selection is done in a haphazard or careless manner, but it only means that sampling is done without any bias or prejudice, whereby portion of the universe has an equal chance of getting included into sample. So these laws are telling us that because you are sampling, it does not mean you sample it anyhow. You must follow the required method by selecting it you know in a good manner without any prejudice or bias that the factors that are first sampling you know sampling is the process of, by which a sam sample population is reduced in size to an amount of homogeneous material that can be commonly handled in the laboratory and whose composition is representation of those populations so a sample is a small portion extracted from the bulk and is taken for analysis. What is the purpose of your sampling? The purpose of sampling, you know, or the factors affecting sampling must be known. You must have a purpose. So one of the factors is the purpose of analysis. Why am I doing this analysis? What do I want to get out of this analysis? You know, those are your purpose. You must have why you are running the sample. The nature of the bulk material will also de determine how you will sample. Or if it's a liquid, if it's a solid, if it's a gas, or if it's a homogeneous material or a heterogeneous material. And then your expected accuracy of your result will also determine you the factor. You know, especially sampling of drugs requires high accuracy. And then the time required for sampling all these things you must know and we say what are the purpose of sampling you want to provide the acceptability of that material you are sampling that is your purpose you want to detect the contamination of that sample and you identify the material and estimate the material present in your sample you know sampling a homogeneous material liquid and gases a homogeneous material is a mixture in which the composition is uniform throughout the mixture for example sugar in water and salt added to water and also blood example of homogeneous material what we say we can use a graph sampling that is one sample taken at random that can be used for homogeneous material. For example, if we want to analyze tap water, we we'll allow the tap to run for some time, maybe five minutes, and we we'll clean the mouth of the tap with cotton wool before filling the container, before collecting our sample. For other liquids, we still wear to ensure homogeneity before collecting the sample. And for gas sample, we flush the sampler and sample container before we collect the sample. For pure liquids, we pour out the needed sample or we dip the sampler into the middle and collect the sample, making sure that both the sampler and the sample container are chemically clean. 
a little quantity of the liquid is used to rinse the sampler before taking the sample. I will sample with a small TEF, a device for obtaining aliquots at different levels, not just straight, but also in diagonal. We sample salt with a clean spatula. You know, our laboratory salt we collect with a clean spatula. And for the liquid materials, materials that always uh, hydrate, taking water, we have to dry in an oven at 105 degrees centigrade to remove absorbed water completely and be sure of the weight of your sample before you sample. You know, these are examples for a steel or metal. We drill in a hole in a diagonal manner and collect the chippings, which are combined for analysis. How do we collect a gross sample? You know, for a gross sample, we identify the problem. We collect a gross sample by reducing the gross sample to a laboratory size sample. How do you reduce it? You put all your collected sample together and make a cone. You flatten and divide sample into four equal parts and you collect opposite sides and add together. You continue that division until you have a, a smaller sample that you can call a representative sample that is useful for your laboratory analysis. It's a difficult process, but every student must learn it. Sampling a heterogeneous material can be very, very tasking because they are not all the same. Hydrogenous material, that material that doesn't have a uniform consistency throughout, for example, oil and water, or a chocolate with granite and almond, they are not the same thing. A gross sample is used for heterogeneous sampling, you know, because it is a large representative sample collected from a population or material. For example, you want to sample a flowing stream. A flowing stream should be sampled downstream and upstream at the surface or at the depth, alongside the middle or from the side, taking many samples. Liquids with one phase suspension, we should shake before sampling. You don't just take a liquid and you sample, shake, and then you sample. If you have two phases, you can sample them separately to get very good results. How do you sample a truckload of coal? You select a large number of portions in a systematic manner, you know, from different parts of the bulk and combine and form a laboratory sample. What are sampling a big pile of iron ore? You know, you crush, you cool, you quarter. Iron ore is, is, is strong, so you crush. You will cone it, you will, you, you will uh, quarter them to get a representative sample. To produce a laboratory sample, the final quarter side is ground to powder and tabled to get the final quarter for analysis. What of a sediment sample? Sediment can be collected using a shovel, a trowel, a scoop, panaga, Ekman, or Pona dredge. You can also take bottom graph sampler when you want to sample very deep, you know, and you collect your samples and you homogenize and transfer to the appropriate containers. What soil sample collection is very difficult, but you need to do that. Shallow soil samples, 15 to 30 cm deep, can be taken with scoops, throwers, or shovels. And then stainless steel can be used when sampling for organic and high density polypropylenes. For metals and soil, you use plastic scoop. So, because if you use a metal, it is going to affect your result. So, you use plastics, plastic scoops, or shovel. And then for soil deeper than 30 cm, you use an agar or chorea. Note that for contaminated oil species, you collect samples from various depths. You collect at least 10 to 15 samples from each sampling unit and place in a bucket or tray, you know. And then when you go to your lab, you begin to treat your sample to get a laboratory sample for analysis. And then always remember that a virgin portion should be sampled to serve as a reference. 
I have an assignment for you here. Describe how you can sample the following. A flowing stream, tap water, heavy metals in soil, and trucks of mineral oil. I hope you enjoyed this class. And I would like to see you next time. In the next video, we expect to learn about preparation of sample. Because when we sample, we don't just take our sample and we dump them. We must prepare our sample for analysis. Thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share this video. See you in the next class.